It's a story that began with fanfare, but which is barely known today. In a pioneering gambit, a U.S. Army Reserve colonel endeavors to become the first man to cross the Atlantic by balloon, utilizing advanced technology to traverse the ocean at nearly 40,000 feet. Despite initial success, this high-risk venture soon unravels and ends in mysterious failure. It's 1974. The Atlantic Ocean remains unconquered by balloon crossing, though numerous attempts have been made, with outcomes ranging from disappointment to disaster, including the 1970 flight of the Free Life team that is covered in a separate episode. Enter Thomas L. Gatch, Jr., 48 years old in 1974 and an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve. Gatch is a son of Vice Admiral Thomas L. Gatch, Sr., who played a leading and heroic role in the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands in World War II. In contrast to his famous father, Tom Gatch's career has been a mixed bag in terms of success, but after transitioning to the Army Reserve, he has received regular advancement as he works in various staff positions at the Pentagon, and he promotes to full colonel in 1972. In his personal life, Gatch is fit, has a number of hobbies, and is a fairly successful investor, but has never married despite an on-and-off relationship with a much younger woman. In the early 1970s, with a windfall inheritance in his hands of $100,000, around $750,000 in 2022 dollars, Gatch seeks personal fulfillment and to earn his own place alongside his famous father. Based on technology used by NASA for high-altitude research, Gatch begins developing a plan to make a transatlantic balloon flight. Gatch's balloon system, the Lightheart, will be comprised of 10 balloons, each 26 feet in diameter, stacked in two tiers, with the entire cluster containing approximately 26,000 cubic feet of helium. Unlike traditional zero-pressure helium balloons, which release helium to prevent envelope rupture as the balloon expands with increasing altitude, the Lightheart will utilize super-pressure technology in which the volume of the balloon is constrained by the special balloon material so that the balloons will reach and maintain a relatively constant pressure altitude. This means that, at least in theory, the balloons will maintain the same altitude even during colder temperatures so that the pilot won't have to drop significant ballast during the flight. Nearly 200 feet below the balloon cluster, Gatch will ride in a pressurized 6-foot diameter sphere. In theory, this system of only around 1,600 pounds, 725 kilograms, dead weight, around the same weight as an empty Cessna 172, will enable him to cross the Atlantic at 38,000 feet, 11,500 meters, overflying the kinds of weather that doomed other previous attempts, including the ill-prepared Free Life flight a few years prior. Gatch avoids seeking sponsorship and approaches the project in a careful manner, arranging consultations with knowledgeable experts in balloon manufacture and high-altitude research, and he earns his FAA balloon pilot certificate. Gatch oversees the entire project himself, hiring contractors only for the specialized projects that he cannot perform personally. The 10 super-pressure balloons are built by Raven Industries, a reputable balloon manufacturer. His capsule is custom-built by an industrial laminates manufacturer, and Gatch does the outfitting himself, including the construction of a home-built air purifier, which will mitigate carbon dioxide buildup in the sealed capsule. As the project is coming together technically, Gatch also meets with FAA representatives to lay the procedural groundwork for his flight, and agrees to raise his intended flight altitude from 38,000 feet to 39,000 feet, 11,900 meters, to better clear the commercial air traffic over the Atlantic. In order to operate at this higher altitude, Gatch will have to give up most of the ballast that he'd planned to bring, which will limit his ability to offset loss of lift due to a lost balloon or cooler temperatures. Despite this concession, Gatch is still encountering bureaucratic headwinds. From the perspective of the FAA, because Gatch did not hand-build at least 51% of the balloon system components, the Lightheart is not eligible for an airworthiness certificate in the experimental category, and thus Gatch cannot legally fly it. Undaunted, 
Gatch presses forward, intending to fly illegally if the FAA is unwilling to budge. As the launch site, Gatch prudently chooses the Olmsted Air National Guard facility at the Harrisburg Airport in Pennsylvania, which is located well inland so that he can ascend to altitude in daylight while still over land, providing better abort options in case of equipment malfunctions. However, as Gatch makes the decision to move ahead with the mission, the balloon and capsule have never been assembled together, let alone tested in a long-duration overland flight or a pressure chamber to simulate the conditions and possible contingencies that he will face over the Atlantic. Gatch does not publicly announce his plans until he feels that he is ready to go, eliminating at least one source of pressure. However, one friend, upon viewing the 200-pound, 90 kilogram capsule and homemade air purification system upon which Gatch's life will depend, expresses concern about his chances of survival. Addressing the possibility that this venture could prove fatal, Gatch responds, what a glorious way to go. On the evening of Saturday, February 16th, 1974, at the National Guard hangar at Harrisburg Airport, Gatch orders the balloons to be inflated intending to launch early on February 17th. Unfortunately, the weather the next day does not support a launch, and conditions aren't much better the following Monday. After three nights of waiting, the pressure is building due to the media presence, the unpaid volunteers who are donating their time to assist with the launch, and the incessant warning calls from the FAA who have caught wind of his intent to fly without proper airworthiness certification. On the evening of Monday, February 18th, Gatch finally gets the weather opening that he's been seeking. Although this will mean a nighttime launch and climb, he seizes the opportunity. The capsule and individual balloons are brought out of the hangar in procession and he lifts off at 7.29 p.m. Eastern Time. Ascending into the night sky, Gatch establishes radio contact with air traffic control who dutifully track his transponder and route other air traffic around him, regardless of the illegal status of his flight. The first hour of the ascent is nominal, and around an hour into his flight, the Lightheart is climbing through 37,000 feet, 11,300 meters, and traveling with the jet stream at a ground speed of 130 knots when the center balloon within the lower cluster ruptures. The Lightheart begins losing altitude, and Gatch works quickly to jettison ballast in the form of 10 pounds of antifreeze fluid that is siphoned overboard through a specially designed outlet in the capsule. Although the capsule finally stabilizes at an altitude of 35,500 feet, 10,800 meters, Gatch has now jettisoned all of his ballast and has virtually no free lift margin. Having stabilized the emergency, Gatch is still on track and contacts his volunteer support team via radio patch to provide an update on his status. This is kind of golf. I lost the um, lift of one balloon, but it's, uh, it's stabled off now. I'm uh, at a steady 35,550. The situation stabilized now. Um, there's no question about losing one balloon. It's draped over some of the, uh, at least one of the portholes. So During the following hours of Monday night into Tuesday morning, Gatch will establish contact with Bermuda Air Traffic Control and a succession of airliners as the jet stream carries him over the Atlantic. By mid-morning on Tuesday, Gatch overtakes an atmospheric wind trough, a phenomenon that has the effect of pushing the Lightheart well to the south of his intended route. Although the wind direction will eventually reverse and push the Lightheart back towards Europe, this will likely mean that Gatch is headed for southern Europe, perhaps Spain, instead of his desired destination of France. This slight change in course does have the effect of temporarily isolating Gatch by routing him away from the well-traveled commercial air traffic routes between the U.S. and Central Europe. Because the Lightheart carries only a pair of VHF radios, Gatch's sole means of communicating with the outside world is by establishing radio contact with passing aircraft. Now, the change in course means that there will be fewer such opportunities during the middle portion of his transatlantic crossing. As Tuesday morning continues, the Lightheart is sighted by a succession of airliners, some of which establish contact with Gatch. At no point does he indicate any kind of distress. The last sighting and contact occurs on Tuesday, just after noon Eastern Time, when Gatch communicates with a British Airways flight. The pilots inform Gatch that he is almost halfway across the Atlantic, traveling at a ground speed of around 52 knots, with a southwest wind pushing him gradually back towards Europe. 
Gatch's publicists and trackers hear nothing on Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday. The initial assumption is that the Lightheart's limited battery capacity has been exhausted, preventing radio communication, or that Gatch has drifted further south than had been anticipated. Throughout Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday, numerous aircraft attempt to establish radio communications in the blind, though without visually sighting the Lightheart. Based on updated weather reports for high altitude winds, Gatch's support team has reason to believe that the Lightheart may end up in Africa rather than Europe, and a photographer is established to Senegal to await Gatch's presumably imminent arrival, while the U.S. State Department asked the governments of countries along the west coast of Africa to keep a lookout. Thursday into Friday, the sense of concern and urgency builds and the Coast Guard begins notifying vessels to look out for the missing balloon. However, on Friday, February 22nd, disturbing news is received. On the morning of Thursday, February 21st, a cargo ship named the Or Meridian, located around 500 miles west of the Canary Islands, had sighted the light heart, adrift and seemingly lifeless, at an altitude of only about 1,000 feet. 300 meters. Having not previously been notified to expect a manned balloon, let alone one in distress, the ship's crew made no effort to attempt communication via the ship's horn or radio. Although the ship passed nearly underneath the Lightheart, there was no sign of life from the tiny capsule and the crew assumed it to be some kind of unmanned balloon. Search efforts gradually gather momentum, though there is already considerable uncertainty. Did the Lightheart continue to drift at low altitude after the Or Meridian sighting, or did it settle into the water by Thursday evening? The result is that two large search areas are identified. Nevertheless, Gatch's compelling endeavor and predicament grabs significant national media attention, which, along with a press conference led by Gatch's sisters, spurs the Pentagon into action. P-3 Orion patrol aircraft operating from Lages conduct search sorties on six days, beginning on Sunday, February 24th. However, after a total search effort that covers over 200,000 square miles, no trace of Gatch or his balloon is discovered. Even assuming that the Lightheart has landed within the search area and not sunk, finding the tiny white capsule bobbing in the ocean is a proverbial needle in a haystack search, and by March 6th, two weeks after the last sighting of the Lightheart, the Pentagon announces that the search will be terminated. No further trace of Colonel Gatch or the Lightheart is ever found. While ambitious, Gatch's transatlantic plan was not casual or amateurish. Gatch consulted with knowledgeable professionals and his plan to use super-pressured balloons was endorsed by an expert on this technology at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Gatch did take the time to earn an FAA balloon pilot certificate, and he was an apt and steady learner. An experienced balloon pilot who flew with him described Gatch as having a cool head with nerves of steel. Nothing fazed him. He was meticulous. He wrote down everything. He was very thorough. However, Gatch had made only 19 balloon ascensions and logged only 23 hours of flight time prior to his fateful trip. Moreover, the advanced super-pressure balloon system that he used for his transatlantic attempt was technically quite different from the hot air balloons in which he trained, and his launch on February 18, 1974, was the first use of a super-pressure balloon system for a manned flight. Gatch's plan did include some consideration for off-nominal situations. Utilizing 10 balloons was intended to provide enough free-lift margin to allow the flight to continue even if a single balloon burst. Indeed, even with the loss of the single balloon early in the flight, Gatch was able to proceed as intended, albeit at a slightly lower altitude. Taking into account only the lift capability of their remaining balloons, Gatch should have been able to reach Europe. However, the Or Meridian sighting on Thursday morning indicates that something went seriously wrong at some point after midday on Tuesday. The distance between the Lightheart's location when it was sighted by the British Airways flight on Tuesday and when the Or Meridian crew observed it on Thursday morning was far short of the distance the Lightheart should have covered if it had remained at altitude and been carried along by the jet stream. Following the loss of the first balloon and Gatch expending all the ballast that he could jettison from within the pressurized capsule, the Lightheart had only a thin margin of lift capability. Any decrease in that margin due to dropping temperature at night or accumulation of moisture, for example, could cause the balloon system to descend to lower altitude. However, 
at a lower altitude at which it was safe to open the capsule hatch. Gatch could have jettisoned ballast in the form of cutting free the ruptured balloon, which would have significantly improved his buoyancy and allowed him to remain aloft with the nine remaining balloons. However, the captain of the Or Meridian asserted that both he and the first mate had counted only eight balloons intact when they encountered the Lightheart on Thursday. Assuming their count of the balloon cluster was accurate, this means that another balloon ruptured at some point after midday on Tuesday. With the Lightheart down to only eight balloons, Gatch would have been hard pressed to jettison enough ballast to offset the decrease in lift, and the Lightheart likely would have spent at least one night at sea level, dragging the capsule along the wave tops, an experience which would have been nauseating at best and fatal at worst. When the crew of the Orem Meridian observed a seemingly unmanned capsule on Thursday morning, it's possible that Gatch was still on board, but dead, unconscious, or asleep after a painful and exhausting night during which the capsule was dragged across the wave tops. It's also possible that Gatch egressed the capsule after it touched down on the ocean. Although he carried a life raft and emergency radio, he had never practiced an emergency egress from the capsule while on the water, a process which would have been challenging in anything other than calm seas and perhaps nearly impossible at night. There are also at least two other scenarios that could have afflicted the lightheart and explain the lack of communication after midday on Tuesday. The first possibility is a Gatch succumbed to carbon dioxide poisoning due to a malfunction with his homemade air scrubber. While the scrubber was conceptually simple and Gatch seemed to have a thorough understanding of how to operate it and monitor the air quality, he never performed any kind of long duration test of the system. Second, the capsule might have experienced explosive decompression. While the capsule integrity held during the first part of the flight, the pressure may have increased as the sun heated the capsule during the first day aloft, and Gatch may have failed to vent the excess pressure or been prevented from doing so due to a stuck vent valve. Although Gatch carried an oxygen mask and emergency bottle, the time of useful consciousness at 35,000 feet is 30 seconds to one minute, requiring him to recognize the situation and don his mask in a rapid manner. He would have then had to open the capsule hatch, remove the balloon that had ruptured earlier in the flight, and activate the detonation core to deflate another balloon in order to initiate a descent into breathable air, tasks that might have been challenging to accomplish in the freezing temperatures at high altitude and with a limited supply of oxygen. For the flight of the Lightheart, Gatch relied on a number of technologies and procedures that, while conceptually straightforward, had not been integrated or rehearsed beforehand. Moreover, Gatch operated on a shoestring budget and with limited staff support. Ideally, Gatch should have conducted a thorough rehearsal for the flight to practice procedures, identify problems, and otherwise buy down risk. However, Given the unique nature of super-pressure balloons as single-use articles, doing a test flight over land would have required the purchase of another set of balloons with the primary set already consuming 50% of the project's budget. Short of a full-scale practice flight, Gatch could have at least conducted a sealed, long-duration test of the capsule to ensure proper operation of the critical carbon dioxide scrubber. This kind of detailed mission rehearsal should have included a failure effects model in which Gatch and his team would envision various off-nominal conditions and identify the exact corrective actions that would be taken. For example, how much ballast would Gatch release if one balloon burst? At what altitude would he stop descending? If a second balloon ruptured, how would he go about jettisoning additional ballast? Dealing with such non-rehearsed situations, Gatch would have been on his own. His communication plan relied entirely on using relatively short-range VHF radios to establish contact with other aircraft, providing at best intermittent opportunities to obtain advice from his support team. In retrospect, it seems that he could have made use of a ham radio to establish long-range radio contact, but perhaps he did not feel that he had the weight or financial budget for this additional resource. A central thread in these after-action observations is that Gatch had very little in the way of personnel support for his mission, and there was no chief of staff nor any other individual who was formally designated to help manage the myriad details of the flight and, critically, to review his procedures, challenge his assumptions, and otherwise address gaps in his planning. Final, and possibly fatal, was the minimal free-lift margin of the 10-balloon system. 
The ability of the Lightheart to continue flight after the loss of a single balloon was more theoretical than realistic, especially given the fateful decision to forgo the originally planned ballast weight in order to reach the 39,000 foot altitude desired by the FAA, rather than the 38,000 foot altitude for which the entire system and weight budget had been structured. Given that Gatch ultimately launched the Lightheart in violation of FAA regulations, it is sadly ironic that these changes that he made in order to earn the goodwill of the FAA likely played a significant role in the mission's failure. Having said all of this, Gatch's transatlantic attempt is still remarkable. Despite Gatch's lack of experience as a balloon pilot, the Lightheart being a one-man show that he managed himself on a limited budget using unproven technology, Gatch made it almost halfway across the Atlantic. This achievement is remarkable when set in the context of other transatlantic attempts that followed Gatch. All were led by men who were much more experienced balloon pilots than Gatch and who used balloons that were much larger and more expensive than the Lightheart. Despite apparently better preparations, at least four other efforts would fail in the years between Gatch's 1974 flight and the successful transatlantic crossing by the Double Eagle II in 1978. In the end, without equipment failures, Colonel Gatch probably could have succeeded in being the first to reach Europe via balloon flight. The Lightheart was impressive for being simple and yet taking advantage of fairly advanced technology. Had he made it to Europe, Gatch would have been hailed for his bold and innovative approach. However, this high-performance balloon system left little margin for the kinds of problems that would be almost inevitable during the first use of such technology. Given the novel nature of his equipment, and without robust testing and rehearsal, the odds were ultimately not in his favor. The story of Colonel Gatch and the Lightheart is not well documented in visual media. I'm therefore grateful and honored for the support of Bill Armstrong, retired U.S. Navy Reserve Captain and a longtime gas balloonist himself. Captain Armstrong was Colonel Gatch's publicist for the flight and had a first-hand role in the preparations for the flight and the subsequent search efforts. Without the unique imagery and documentation that he provided, this story could not have been told. His book, Just Wind, which I'll link in the description below, contains a complete biography of Colonel Gatch and tells the Lightheart story in greater detail than is possible in this video.